Thank you. And we're back from our break. And we're, we're privileged and pleased to have with us Dr. Danielle Hyman, uh, Medical Affairs Director from Jazz Pharmaceutical. Uh, and she's here to talk to us about excessive daytime sleepingness and understanding it. And uh, before I, I hand the mic to her, I'll say this, you know, one thing that we have done as a patient advocacy association is start to, co to connect the dots with what we do with sleep. Uh, with how it's affecting our, our functioning during the daytime. And I think right now where it's really having the most profound effect is on those that are helping protect us, like you heard from Dr. Partha Sarathi, uh, the frontline doctors, the, the garbage truck drivers, uh, the EMTs, uh, some of the frontline people that you'll hear, us, uh, patients that you'll talk about later. So, so knowing that there's tools out there that are potential adjuncts uh, to help our, our, our population is, is very exciting for us to learn about. So with that being said, Dr. Hyman, take it away. Thanks, Adam. Um, and before I begin, I do want to thank you and the ASAA for allowing me to come and join you all today. Um, I really appreciate the, the invitation, so thank you. Um, Mark, can you toss my slides up there, please? So just again, by way of introduction, I am Dr. Danielle Hyman. Um, I am an employee at Jazz Pharmaceuticals. I'm the global medical director um, there, and I'm, I'm very honored to be included as part of your uh, presenter panel today. If you go to the next slide, so at Jazz, our mission is really to develop life-changing medicines for people with limited or no options so they can have, um, so they can live their lives more fully. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see that by um, creating medicines alone, we really can't achieve that message. And so what we really need to do is address the unmet medical needs along the entire patient journey. So part of the reason why I'm excited to be here with all of you today is because I get to share with you a research project that we conducted that really hopes to address um, the first two circles that you're seeing along this treatment line. So helping us to better understand um, excessive daytime sleepiness with obstructive sleep apnea, and then also better helping us um, educate physicians and, and patients on what this condition is so that they can get to a diagnosis um, more quickly. I'm excited to actually see Sai Partha Sarathi on the panel today because he's one of the physicians that actually assisted us with some of this research. So I don't know if he's still on the call, but Sai, um, feel free to interrupt me if you have any additional comments as we're going through here. Before I get into the research itself, I do just want to take a step back and explain to you a little bit more about what do I mean when I say excessive daytime sleepiness associated with obstructive sleep apnea. I think a lot of individuals experience sleepiness, and I think in particular a lot of individuals with obstructive sleep apnea experience sleepiness. So what is it exactly when I say EDS associated with OSA? You'll see that this is a condition that can really leave people feeling extremely drowsy during the daytime. Um, in certain circumstances, you'll see individuals who fall asleep when they don't want to or they're falling asleep at times at which they shouldn't. It's really a pervasive um, level of sleepiness that these patients experience or that these individuals experience. It's not just the sleepiness that you feel after one bad night of sleep or um, maybe just for a short period of time, but it's an impactful amount of sleepiness that hinders them from, from really fully enjoying or fully interacting with their daily lives. Um, it's not really well known what the underlying cause of this is. There is some very limited evidence showing that, uh, you know, untreated sleep apnea, if it's not treated for a long period of time, may actually change the way um, that your brain regulates sleep and wake. And it's thought that this may be one cause for um, the EDS and OSA. But there are a lot of different reasons for why someone might be sleepy. And so it's important that if, if you're exper experiencing those symptoms that you reach out to your doctor and get um, the appropriate diagnosis. In addition, one of the other things that we've learned while, while doing some research in this field is that really none of us are good at understanding the level of sleepiness that we feel. I think we all do a great job of um, masking our symptoms. I know I'm, I'm one of these individuals who likes our cup of coffee in the morning and maybe in the afternoon. Um, and so these types of behaviors can actually um, hinder you or can, can mask your underlying sleepiness levels. So um, one of the, the fallbacks of this is the fact that it leaves people from getting diagnosed um, more quickly and can take a significant period of time for individuals to get diagnosed. And you can see this in some of the data as well. So if you go to the next slide, this is a um, research project that we did where essentially we looked at the number of patients who were getting diagnosed with OSA, and then within that group, the number of patients that were getting diagnosed with excessive daytime sleepiness over this four-year period. Um, and what we have, uh, what we have found, which um, the graph isn't here on the slide, but essentially the diagnosis for OSA 
were gradually increasing. And if you look at the center section of this graph, you'll see the arrow line for the number of individuals who were getting diagnosed with EDS was actually declining over, the, over that same four-year period. And you wouldn't expect to see a decline unless something significant had happened to change the way that these patients were being treated or that their OSA was being managed. So this suggests that there are a number of patients that are underdiagnosed within the U.S. for um, excessive daytime sleepiness in OSA. One of the ways uh, that we can better help um, physicians diagnose um, EDS and OSA and understand this patient population is really to, to give a voice to the patients who are suffering from it um, and allow them to explain to us a little bit more about how this is impacting their daily lives so that we can be better at educating clinicians on how to diagnose it. Um, and also it helps to inform us of what are those more impactful symptoms that we should be thinking about when we're developing treatments for this patient population. So when we began working in this area, we found that there was really a limited amount of data um, that spoke to um, the experience of living with EDS and OSA from a patient perspective. And so that was really the goal of the study that I'm going to present to you today is to um, listen to the patients, get a better understanding from them of exactly what their burden was or what they struggle with on a daily basis um, when dealing with excessive daytime sleepiness uh, associated with OSA. So the results of this study. So we essentially conducted um, research or interviews with 41 patients who were identified as having excessive daytime sleepiness associated with obstructive sleep apnea. Um, and these were conducted in small group settings so that it allowed us to have a really rich conversation and, and follow up to some of the comments and things that they were saying so that we could get a really good understanding for how they were describing their symptoms. The interesting thing and, and um, that I think you'll find is um, when you're looking at this information and also when you think back to what you found in your own awake surveys, there's a lot of similarities um, between some of the uh, responses that we were hearing and what you guys have heard as well. So it was interesting to me to see how much of an overlap there really was between these two surveys that were conducted. Um, so within the one that we did, the average age of the participants when they were diagnosed um, with OSA was 43 and a half years. Um, more than 50% of the participants actually reported that they had experienced their symptoms for more than a year. And unfortunately, it was about an average of 11 and a half years that these patients had suffered with their symptoms before they even saw a doctor. So there was an extended period of time between when they started to experience their OSA symptoms and they um, got diagnosed, which again, I think is something that you all found in your survey as well. The um, symptoms that most commonly drove the patients in to see their doctor was really snoring and EDS. Um, and again, um, the next bullet point here, several had considered their symptoms to be normal rather than a sign of a serious medical condition. And I think this goes back to the idea of, you know, we're not always so good at understanding um, what might be a sign of something that actually needs to be treated. And I, this is essentially what we found here. And I particularly liked this quote that's on the, the purple circle here on the right side of the graph. This is a quote from one of our participants. And she said, I figured I'm just tired. I'm just always going to be tired. This is just kind of how my life is. And it's that resolve of there isn't anything better that really keeps people sometimes from going out and seeking the treatment that they need. So here again, the majority of the patients or our participants reported that the reason that they sought treatment was really due to the input from their spouse or their partner or another family or a friend um, that was uh, encouraging them to go uh, follow up with their doctor about their symptoms. Um, some of the other uh, reasons that were reported in our study were falling asleep at work. Um, several of them reported uh, they had had a car accident from falling asleep, um, and in addition, some of them had just fallen asleep while driving. In addition to that, there was also many participants who were concerned about some of their own symptoms, in addition to having their family members or friends tell them that, you know, maybe we should get this, get this checked out. And so there were a number of reasons that really drove these patients into the clinic. So when we asked the participants, tell me how you describe your excessive daytime sleepiness, because you can imagine that most of us don't walk around using that term. And what I found most interesting from this is that most of the time, the patients, when they would, would explain to us how they were feeling, they would use terms like tired, tiredness, um, feeling exhausted, they reported uh, feeling like they could never get enough sleep. 
Um, and interestingly, if you look at the second bullet here, they were 50% used a term called brain fog or feeling out of it, which again is something that I think um, was found in your own survey as well as feeling this um, level of, of not being able to fully function or, or um, just that their cognition was impaired. And again, the quote to the right here speaks to this of, you obviously don't have the level of high acuity that I would think that I think all of us would have normally. It's a fog. You're in a fog. So it's almost to the point where this participant felt like he was at a deficit because he couldn't fully function um, due to his sleepiness. So the, the number one area where the participants told us that they felt most significantly impacted was their physical health and functioning. Um, over 90% of the participants rated this as number one. Um, and you can see some of the, the um, comments that were made around uh, how they felt they were impacted here. So needing to take naps, they felt decreased in their energy levels, falling asleep during activities. Um, decreased physical activity. And again, I think the two quotes on the right are, are resonate probably well um, for the fact that you don't want to go out and do a lot of these physical activities if you're already feeling tired to start with. Um, I think one of the other interesting findings here is that it wasn't just a, a feeling of like, I couldn't be active, but they really felt that it was a um, impact on their overall health and their overall well-being in order to take care of themselves on a daily basis. Um, cognitive impacts. So again, this is something that I mentioned earlier that, that was found also in your own AWAKE survey. So 90% of the participants reported that EDS had affected their um, cognition, both at work and in their personal lives. And the way in which they described this was really, um, they didn't feel like they were able to concentrate, uh, decreased level of alertness. Some of them even mentioned that they didn't think that they could be as creative as what they wanted to, or really had to be had the, um, were, were not as able to be as thoughtful um, as what they would like to be both at work and at home. And obviously this would lead to work impacts. So 90% of our patients reported at some point having um, a work-related experience where um, their sleepiness had really impacted their ability to work. And about 25% of the participants actually reported that they had fallen asleep at work and this had been observed by a colleague or, or their boss. Um, and in some circumstances, as you can see, probably from this last quote here on the bottom, it resulted in either um, a loss of job or the need to actually change the position because the work that they had been doing was quite dangerous if they were to fall asleep during it. And so they transitioned over. Um, and I think this kind of resonates with your topic today. I think Adam mentioned before, you know, that, that patients with excessive daytime sleepiness with OSA aren't a specific group that aren't included in all of your first line workers, your shift workers, all of that patient population. And so imagine um, trying to balance this in with everything else that they're dealing with at this time. Um, so again, it's not just impacts at, at, um, on your work life, but it's also an impact on your life outside of work. So 90% of the persistence participants um, reported that it impacted their daily lives outside of work. Um, more concerning, 75% actually reported that their EDS had uh, affected their driving and Ford actually had car accidents due to the fact that they had fallen asleep at the wheel. Um, and I think the purple um, uh, narrative on the left is a good description of someone who just didn't feel like he could stay awake even while he was driving. And so he stopped at a red light, um, closed his eyes for a few minutes just to rest his eyes and ended up falling asleep. Um, the other part of this that, I, that, that we found too was that there was a significant impact on, on how they felt they were able to care for those in their families or care for those around them. Um, and so the quote on the, the right is from a mother. Um, she said, I want to be able to do homework and be a bright, cheery, happy mood. Like, hey, what are we learning today? And instead, it, it's like, okay, come on, let's do your homework. Um, which leads me to the next slide, because I think not only does that impact your ability to be there for those around you, but it also impacts your emotional well-being as well when you feel like you're letting those around you down. And so about 70% of our, our participants reported experiencing emotional impacts. And worry was and anxiety were really some of the top ones that came out. Um, a lot of those were, were linked to, you know, concerns around safety risk. Um, so driving um, motor vehicle accidents. Um, but in addition to that, we saw that there was a high number of participants that reported just irritability, crankiness, moodiness, or grumpiness, which I, I think we can all relate to. I know in particular, my three-year-old can relate to this when he's not had a good night's sleep or he's been um, missed his afternoon nap. You get cranky and you get tired um, and, it, and it doesn't always come out the way that you would want it to. And um, so that had a significant impact on a number of our participants.
Um, and again, uh, we, we speak a lot about um, the social impacts of this. And so not only is it, um, you know, impacting the, the patient themselves or the participant themselves, but it's impacting those around them. Um, and about 90% of our participants reported that they really thought that it was impacting particularly their spouse or their partner. Um, some of the ways that it, it impacted them are listed here below. So fewer social activities, they were shorter and patient with others. Um, it negatively impacts their relationship with their friends and their family. So I, I know that was a lot of information, um, but I do just want to take a moment and just kind of recap on what we said. So really the overall findings, which I don't think would be surprising to anyone on this call, is that EDS with OSA really does put a tremendous burden on the participants that, that, that are included and also the individuals who experience this. Um, and it's not just an impact on the individuals themselves, but it can also impact those around them. So really, this highlights the need for us to be better about being able to identify um, excessive daytime sleepiness in OSA so that we can better manage those patients. So again, many of the participants here reported um, having experienced either EDS or OSA symptoms um, for years prior to seeking medical attention. So I would, I would implore all of you who are on the call today that if any of this information really resonates with you, please talk to your doctor about your symptoms. Uh, it's important that you get diagnosed with, with whatever that condition might be. Um, and I also want to bring up a point that I think Sai was making earlier. You know, even in our current situation, a number of our, our sleep doctors have really adapted um, their practices so that they can still reach out and can still work with their patients. So even in this time, um, if, if this is something that is resonating with you, please talk with your doctor. Um, that's all that I have for today. Again, I just wanna say thank you um, to Adam and to the team for letting me join you guys. Um, and I hope you have a good rest of your afternoon. Dr. Swick is the current medical director at uh, Takeda Pharmaceuticals and is a former neurologist, or not a former, he is a neurologist, <laughs> who, who uh, ran a, a sleep clinic for many years and, as I mentioned earlier today, uh, was one of our, uh, our, our awake angels originally when we started the program a couple years ago with, I think it was Hurricane Irma, when we sent a couple hundred machines down to Texas for those patients that lost all theirs. So, uh, happy to have you back and we're happy to learn a lot about the, the role that Erexin plays in, in uh, sleepiness um, because we are a sleep apnea population and not, a, not necessarily a narcolepsy first. And so this whole world is somewhat new to us. So any sort of education you could help give to our, our patients uh, would be gratefully uh, welcome. So take it away. Well, thank you, Adam. And thank you, Justine. And thank you for the American Sleep Apnea Association for having me on. I've been listening to the uh, talk from the beginning, and my hat's off to you guys. This is a groundbreaking, cutting-edge presentation, and this is going to be the realm for many years to come, and I think you've just done a wonderful job. And I want to thank the uh, previous presenters. Uh, for laying the groundwork for what I'm going to be talking about today, because orexin is a neurotransmitter, it's also called hypocretin, that was just discovered 21 years ago. And it has enabled us to get a much better understanding of what allows us to wake up in the morning and conversely, how it changes over the course of the day, and how it allows sleep to come on. And there are illnesses, and Adam just mentioned one of them is narcolepsy, but in sleep apnea, orexin also plays a part. That's part of the research that is being done not only uh, by Takeda Pharmaceuticals, but throughout the world in the role of orexin in regulating sleep and wakefulness. So, can I have my first slide? Let me get through the legal representations here. I'm an employee of Takeda Pharmaceuticals, uh, and Takeda is the sponsor of several preclinical studies and clinical trials of Orexin agonists. 
and uh, the presentation is for your informational and educational uh, use. And we really are not referring to any drug that is approved by the FDA or any other regulatory agency for prescription use. Uh, all third-party research and information is clearly credited, and you will see the references on our slides. And if you have questions after this, I will not be taking questions, but you can get them through either the ASAA or through your healthcare provider. Next slide, please. As I said, this uh, neurotransmitter was discovered uh, and published by two, cent two centers, literally two weeks apart. One center was out in California. The other center was in Dallas, Texas. And that's why there are two names, by the way, orexin and hypocretin. But they're the same thing. They're the same compounds. And it is functional as a signaling molecule or neurotransmitter, meaning that it is produced in one part of the brain and has its actions elsewhere. Uh, a similar kind of compound would be a hormone, but this is within the context of the central nervous system. Now, the link between orexin and the control of wakefulness and sleep is really cutting-edge technology. And there have been uh, breakthroughs in how it controls wakefulness as well as sleep. And we know that uh, there are two different kinds of neurotransmitters in the orexin family that interact with two different receptors. A neurotransmitter and its receptor is very akin to a lock and key. The lock is the receptor, the key is the neurotransmitter. And you have to have the right key in order to activate the lock. And in this particular case, you need to have the right neurotransmitter in order to activate the right receptor. Orexin receptor type 2, OX2R, is the one that we think is the master controller of wakefulness, and it regulates REM and non-REM sleep. And the OX1 receptor mainly controls the reward centers of the brain and probably other physiologic functions that we really haven't quite uh, fully discerned at this point. And here you see in this cartoon pretty much how this works. The little pellets that you see traveling across the screen will activate the receptors as, again, those act, those act like keys into the lock. And then you see the effect where those signaling molecules are released by the nerves. And when they are released, wakefulness ensues. And in the top part, you see what happens as that little pellet enters that right configuration on the OX2R receptor, which allows the lock to be unlocked. And in this case, for the neurochemical to be released downstream. Orexin levels in the brain rise and fall, much like our circadian rhythms rise and fall as the day goes on. The dashed line represents wakefulness, and there you see the sun. The red bar is the amount of orexin that is produced in the brain. And by the way, it is produced in a very small area of the brain called the hypothalamus. However, don't let that fool you because the amount of arborizations, meaning the amount of neurons that emanate from that hypothalamus, is one of the most extensive in the central nervous system with with dendrites going into the uh, brain, the cortex, and down into the brain strip, uh, brainstem. There you go. Now, so here you see the summary. During the day, you have high levels of orexin maintaining wakefulness, and at night, with that nice little crescent moon, you have a lower level of orexin, which is allowing sleep to ensue. And there you see the timing of the orexin changes over the course of a 24-hour time frame. This is a 
slide that has been alluded to in other talks. And um, what we have done, and we have looked at uh, mouse models. And uh, the next slide, I'll show you what we have seen in human uh, neuroimaging studies. But in the mouse model, which is the best way for us at this point to experimentally look at the effects of orexin on sleep and wakefulness, we are able to mimic different kinds of pathologic conditions. In one, we're able to maintain uh, chronic sleep deprivation by keeping the mouse awake. And during that time, we actually are able to demonstrate loss of orexin neurons in the brains of these um, experimental animals. If you lose those orexin neurons, you're going to lose that ability to maintain this neurotransmitter to promote wakefulness. And in its absence, what you're going to have is a net result of decreased wakefulness, increased sleepiness. The intermittent short sleep, all of us who have sleep apnea, and I'm included in that, know that before I started CPAP, my sleep was terribly fragmented. Short periods of sleep punctuated by periods of wakefulness. And that's the paradigm that we were able to affect in this group of uh, experimental animals. And again, we were able to demonstrate loss of orexin neurons in the brains of these animals. So we're taking what we know to be human attributes in terms of uh, phenotypic symptoms and creating a mouse model and looking to see what changes that are affected in the brains of these animals. And you can see that there is significant findings. Then what we were able to do is using a compound that's an orexin-2 receptor agonist, meaning it is a drug that activates the orexin-2 receptor in both healthy and sleepy mice, we were able to get a generalized increase in wakefulness. So by activating these receptors and in both the sleepy mouse as well as the non-sleepy mouse, we were able to wake them up even further. And that is a very promising result. And that has allowed uh, Takeda to increase its a, uh, quest to find drugs that can do the same thing. Here you see a cartoon uh, cross-section of a human brain. And I want you to take a look at the LH, which stands for lateral hypothalamus. That's where the orexin molecules originate from. And the blue lines represent the neurons that are emanating from that lateral hypothalamus. And you can see it going up into the cerebral cortex. And if you take a look, there are some shorter blue arms that are going down into the brainstem. That's important because in order to wake up, you have to wake the brain up. That's the cerebral cortex. And you have to maintain a high degree of persistent wakefulness, which comes from stimulating cells in the brainstem, which are responsible for the maintenance of wakefulness. And there you see uh, the dorsal raphe nucleus and the pedunculo pontine tegmental nucleus, locus ceruleus, and an area above the brainstem, uh, also in the hypothalamus, close to where the orexin cells originate, is something called the tuberomamillary nucleus. All of these red circles are centers of the brain and brainstem that are responsible for keeping us awake. So what we are hypothesizing is that the orexin, which is coming out of the lateral hypothalamus, is keeping the cortex awake and maintaining the activation of these specific sites in the brainstem to maintain wakefulness throughout the day. 
So to summarize, we believe that orexin is the master regulator of sleep and wakefulness. I typically call it the master conductor. When a conductor raises his baton, the orchestra increases its volume and intensity. And that's the equivalent of wakefulness. When the conductor lowers his baton, the orchestra gets far more quiet and he can stop the music. And that's what sleep. And that's how I kind of analogize the erection system. And the erection levels in the brain are higher during the day and lower at night, as we demonstrated on that cartoon. And how this relates to sleep apnea is this third bullet point. And we have said that new scientific studies are investigating the role of orexin to help with residual daytime sleepiness. And you heard a wonderful lecture uh, from Dr. Hyman about the fact that EDS is a very common uh, symptom in patients with OSA. And we know that there is a substantial proportion of patients who are adequately treated with things like CPAP who continue to experience daytime sleepiness. And we are trying to find ways to mitigate that daytime sleepiness. But the one caution I want to add here is that even when we find medicines to treat that residual daytime sleepiness, it does not negate the fact that CPAP still needs to be used to produce the opening of the airway, which is the necessary component of treatment of sleep apnea. And with that, I want to thank you for your time. And I want to say that this is just an incredible way to learn. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Adam. We appreciate the, the work that you've done for us, Dr. Swick, and we appreciate the education. Uh, I'm sure we'll be doing a lot more of this as we go because I think the, the education factor uh, and, and our ability to translate this from, from, from your guys' vocabulary, especially at, at a high-end level as, as neurology, uh, down into a, a layman's terms. I always say if I can't explain it to my daughter, I don't understand it myself. <laughs> so <clears throat> this has been, uh, I think, a really good introduction for our community about excessive daytime sleepiness earlier with Dr. Hyman and about the role of Erexon that, 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 that you presented here. And I think it'll, as we continue to use our CPAPs and our, and, our, and our behavioral change and work on our nutrition and all these other things, we're really going to be able to start to figure out what's the right combination of, of therapies for sleep apnea patients. So with that, thank you so much. We will see you next time. There will be a next time. Our Awake Angels is very simple, is that people can make donations to sleepapnea.org and they can help provide replacement factory sealed masks for our patients that can't afford them. The most important thing we can do for those that are at home right now is make sure that they have access to their resupplies. Come to sleepapnea.org, visit our CPAP assistance program and see that if you need resupply masks that we have them there for you. And we've helped over 7,000 individual patients get a full machine and mask hookup over the last few years. And we're proud of that. Obviously, right now in this day and age, there's there's a major need for machines and masks. And anything we can do to get them out to our patients is, is, is what we want to do.